The next few moments are devoted to silent prayer. That gives each of you as a believer priest the privacy of your priesthood to rebound if necessary. For if we name our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to purify us from all wrongdoing. When we name our sins to God, we are filled with God the Holy Spirit. God the Holy Spirit is our mentor and our teacher and the one who brings to our memory those things we have forgotten. So with that in mind, let us pray. Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege and freedom to assemble ourselves together for the purpose of learning your word. May God the Holy Spirit enlighten us, and may we have the concentration necessary to assimilate this portion of the word of God into our stream of consciousness. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. I have an article from the Washington Times. Uh, from, from for today, September 11th, 2013. Um, <clears throat> of course, uh, the president uh, gave his speech last night. I didn't watch it. I don't know what he said. But this is what the uh, Russians are doing. The Russian Navy said in a statement that the Moskva cruiser passed through the Straits of Gibraltar on September 10th. Interfax News Agency added that the Moskva carrier or cruiser is commanded by Sergei Tronev, captain first rank of the guards, and he has enough room to maneuver now. The Black Sea flagship entered the Russia's Navy's area of responsibility in the Mediterranean at 11 p.m. Moscow time yesterday, the agency reported a military source is saying. The missile-carrying cruiser ex is expected to join its final destination in eastern Mediterranean on September 15th or 16th. Upon arrival, the command of the Russian Navy unit in the Mediterranean, currently stationed on board the Admiral Penteleev uh, anti-submarine ship, will be relocated to the Moskva. The armaments and technical equipment of the missile cruiser are in working condition. The crew is ready to perform combat missions, the source said. The missile cruiser, initially, initially known to Western naval intelligence as Slava or Glory, was launched in 1979 and entered service in 1983. It was later renamed the Moskva in 1995 designed to be carrier killers. The cruisers of class 1164 are equipped with 16 anti-ship launchers, P-1000 Vulcan or Volcano, SSN-12 sandbox anti-ship missiles, according to NATO classification. Another two vessels, the landing ship Nikolai Vilchenkov and the guard ship Smetlivy will join the Russian naval unit later. They will pass through the Bosporus and Dardanelles Straits by September 12th through the 14th and will then head to the eastern Mediterranean. Russia's defense ministry has said that the maneuvers are part of the stage-by-stage -stage rotation of warships and support ships of the standing naval force in the Mediterranean. The recent deployments are aimed at complex monitoring of the situation around Syria, military sources told Interfax earlier. Russia's standing naval force in the Mediterranean now involves landing craft carriers, five landing craft carriers, I will not attempt to pronounce their names. Also along with that, there will be uh, Es the es an escort vessel and an anti-submarine ship. The anti-submarine ship uh, is coming from uh, Vladivostok, that's, uh, uh, that's west of Japan, northwest of Japan, and that will be moving into the area. Russian naval maneuvers in the Mediterranean come amid growing tension in the region which sparked sparked speculation 
that Russia was boosting its naval, naval presence ahead of a possible U.S. strike against Syria. So that's that article. And if we don't think the Russians are serious concerning what we're doing in that area, uh, we've got another thing coming because there's only one outlet for the Russians to the Mediterranean Sea. They have only one base in the Mediterranean. That base is located in Tartus, Syria. So uh, Syria is one of their closest allies because it does give them close access to the Mediterranean and they don't want the United States involved there in any way whatsoever. And we say we're doing it uh, for humanitarian reasons because the, according to our administration, their regime has gassed its own people. But uh, the rebels who are over there, there's been many articles on what they've been up to. Uh, they go into certain cities that are predominantly Christian and begin executing Christians. So it's really just evil killing evil. And when evil is killing evil, we do not, we should not get involved. That's client nation arrogance. And for us to get involved in a civil war that has absolutely no consequence to our national security, since both sides are evil, in fact, it's better for our national security if they kill each other. We've taken, off, we've taken our eye off the ball when it comes to Iran, the real threat, and we have uh, grossly miscalculated the world response, and uh, it's a real mess, and America has lost its prestige in the world and everything else, and uh, any type of action could very easily get us involved in a World War III because the Russians will not allow us to hit one of their closest allies. It would be as if someone hit Great Britain for us. It's just not, uh, it's not something that they will tolerate. And if you don't think the Russians have a strong pre presence, they already have five landing crafts, a anti- uh, carrier type thing that will destroy aircraft carriers. We're down to 11 aircraft carriers. We have the smallest naval fleet we've had since World War One. before World War One, We've neglected our military in many, many ways, and you say, well, wait, we spend the most on our military than any other country. That's true, but our spending goes toward food, shelter, clothing, uh, the money goes toward those things uh, for housing our military, all of which is necessary. But uh, in order for them to maintain a standard of living and in order for it to even be attractive for people to join, we have to pay a lot of money for our military personnel just due to our standard of living. So much of that money goes toward things like health care and uh, the things that have to do with normal daily living as far as our uh, Air Force goes and all of the other things. Training has been cut back and uh, they're actually considering cutting our uh, naval fleet even further. So we're in real trouble and we don't know it. But on a brighter note, I had here I have here some church bulletins that I wanted to read to you from other churches. Here's one of them. For those of you who have children and don't know it, we have a nursery downstairs. <laughs> the, out, the Outreach Committee has enlisted 25 visitors to make calls on people who are not afflicted with any church. They, you know, affiliated, they misspelled it. The audience is asked to remain seated until the end of the recession. 
Low self-esteem support group will meet Thursday at 7 to 8.30 p.m. Please use the back door. Uh -oh. Anointing of the sick. If you are going to be hospitalized for an operation, contact the pastor. Special prayer also for those who are seriously sick by request. <laughs> the third verse of Blessed Assurance will be sung without musical accomplishment. The sermon title this morning, Women in the Church. Our closing song, Rise Up, O Men of God. The sermon this morning, Gossip, the Speaking of Evil. The closing song, I Love to Tell the Story. The sermon this morning, Contemporary Issues Number 3, Euthanasia. The closing song, Take My Life. Oh my gosh. So, Sometimes I think a pastor needs to review the bulletins put out there, be a little more professional about some things, but we all make mistakes. Now what we've been studying is the fact that angels watch us. We've been studying the invisible hero and the impact the invisible hero has on history. We've studied uh, the six different types of impacts family impact, mother, daughter, father, son, or daughter to mother, son, son to family, uh, all different types of situations in which the relatives are blessed, and also the pets of the righteous are blessed as well. Uh, our social impact has to do in our social circle with our friends. Uh, the impact that is related to any organization in which you work. Uh, that could be a bank, a symphony orchestra, military, law enforcement, or any other type of legitimate organization. I say legitimate because if you're in the mafia, you're at a fellowship most of the time. <laughs> legitimate organizations. Um, we have number four. Uh, the impact, regional impact, such as impact on neighborhood, city, county, state, and nation. Number five is the impact of the missionary. He has a dual impact to the nation he, in which he lives and also to the nation to where he goes to disseminate the gospel and the word of God and to set up churches. In, the, in, in their indigenous uh, culture. We studied all that is, is involved in how a missionary should function. We failed in that area as a client nation for the most part. And also last night we studied heritage impact which is blessing by association with the invisible hero after his death. And I explained why the wicked prosper. And we went over the fact uh, of some verses, 1 Timothy 3.16, which talks about how angels watch, watched our Lord in his incarnation. 1 Corinthians 4.9, the angels watch the Apostle Paul, and the angels watch us, Ephesians 3.10. Also, 1 Timothy 5.21 and 1 Peter 1.12 uh, makes, makes it very clear that the angels themselves long to hear Bible doctrine so right now, they are craning their heads to listen to the Word of God. So obviously, the church age has the most important and unusual testimony. And every church age believer is a testimony to the human race. And we are visible to millions and millions, maybe billions of angels who are invisible to us. So the invisible hero fulfills the very purpose for which we were created and confined to planet Earth, and therefore we have great impact in six different areas. Now what if you fail to become an invisible hero? Well, first of all, invisible heroes are manufactured through the power of God the Holy Spirit and the metabolization of Bible doctrine. That would be the utilization of the two power options. We also noted the fact that you can't sit down and read the Bible on your own and execute the protocol plan of God. 
That does not mean you cannot read the Bible on your own as a supplement, but it does mean that you will not get to spiritual maturity without learning from your right pastor, whomever he may be. And just as there are teachers in school and professors in college, which sets up an authority for you to listen to, you must have an authority when it comes to the teaching of the Word of God. In fact, it's all the more important because if you get to a passage that steps on your toes, you'll have the tendency to glaze right over it and to move on. While the pastor might bring it out and raise his voice a bit and shove it in your face and your toes get stepped on whether he knows it or not. If you play poker very well, he'll never know. Uh, but uh, sometimes you might squirm a bit or turn red in the face. Oh, it hit him. But uh, the fact is, you need that authority to hit you so that you can take a look in the mirror of the Word of God and make changes as necessary, all of which should be done in privacy. So just as we need professors to teach us about things that are temporal, we need the spiritual gift of pastor-teacher who will teach us things that are eternal in value. The purpose of the pastor-teacher is to dig out, categorize, and rightly divide God's truth, the Word of God, in order to teach God's plan for the life of the believer in the church age, namely, to make especially clear the musterion or mystery doctrines of the church age. Your failure to put doctrine first makes the job of the pastor-teacher nearly impossible to communicate the information the pastor has a negative congregation, it is nothing but a thorn in his flesh, and they're always trying to make it nearly impossible for him to properly communicate the information, and oftentimes pastors will succumb to the pressures of a congregation, a negative congregation, rather than separating, as it were, the wheat from the tares. I don't mean that literally, but to separate those who are positive from those who are negative. And the way to do that is to make sure you're teaching the Word of God correctly and with force and that you are reproving and correcting. And eventually, the negative people will clear out. Not all of them. There's always those who like trouble. But you can kick them out if they get involved in gossip against another member in the congregation. For church is not a place of social life or evil social life where people come to gossip about one another as has become mainly what church is about today, but rather it is a place where people can come sit down comfortably in privacy and learn the Word of God without interference or worrying about what someone else is saying about them. That's especially hard for the new believer who's positive toward the word. If they hear that someone's gossiping about them, it becomes a stumbling block to them and they may leave the church. So as a result, the pastor must utilize his authority and kick out the troublemaker. And if all there are troublemakers, kick them all out. Do something else. It's a horrible thing for a pastor to teach a mainly negative congregation. Horrible for the pastor. So your failure to put Bible doctrine first makes the job of the pastor very difficult. The trouble with the church is twofold. First of all, because of negative volition, you cannot learn Bible doctrine uh, and uh, you will consider it too complicated. And what you consider complicated, you will ignore. Or you will, if, uh, I've noticed that when people don't understand something, they have a tendency to make fun of it rather than to learn about it, simply because they don't understand it. That's just the tendency of the old sin nature and negative volition. So because of negative volition, 
You cannot learn Bible doctrines that are too complicated, and you forget Bible doctrines that are too simple. I cannot tell you the number of pastors who no longer teach the basics related to even the rebound technique because of negative volition. They've forgotten rebound or distorted rebound, the most basic of doctrines and the license for you to live the spiritual life. Without it, you're dead in the water. You will not grow spiritually, no matter how often you go to church. doesn't even matter if you go to a doctrinal church. If you are out of fellowship, you don't learn. Because it is the power of the Spirit that teaches us. If you're not under the power of the Spirit, you're not being taught. No matter how much I teach, it's the power of the Spirit that will metabolize the doctrine. We can add to that the number of pastors who don't even understand the gospel of Christ. They can't even give it correctly in a sermon. And that's a very sad situation. Marcus Aurelius, the ancient philosopher, said this, Our life is what our thoughts make it. And this statement is true. And if we extrapolate it into our Christian way of life, it's true in the fact that the believer must have the thinking of Christ. The thinking of Christ. Your spiritual life is a system of thinking. Lack of concentration under the ministry of God the Holy Spirit when Bible doctrine is taught is tantamount to negative volition, and it will result in cosmic involvement. I've often wondered why so many people who come to church oftentimes every time the doors are open, and yet, uh, or they may listen uh, via some other means, uh, digital means, electronics, etc., and they just don't get it. They remain in their legalism or in whatever trend of the old sin nature they follow, and they just seem to not learn anything. The reason? Lack of concentration, no filling of God the Holy Spirit. That's negative volition. So arrogance is the greatest hindrance to becoming an invisible hero. Arrogance. The legalist has a blind arrogance. They're arrogant and don't know it. They may talk about following a right path and use a certain vocabulary and talk about how they're doing a right thing and all of that. Who does that anyway? Arrogant people. Have you ever gone around and told people how great you are? <laughs> Arrogant people do that. I do this and I do that. You should do what I do. The legalist operates in such a manner. I can't even imagine it. It's outside of my frame of reference to run around and tell people of any accomplishment because in the spiritual life, it's all by grace. The only thing you've done is say yes to Bible doctrine. Then grace pursues you as you pursue Bible doctrine. And then you grow in grace and in knowledge. And it's invisible. And you could be walking down the street as a Pleroma believer. People could pass right by you and they're not going to know it. Why? It's invisible. And since it's invisible, sometimes the arrogance of people grabs a hold of them and they say to themselves, I'm not recognized as being great, but I know I'm great. I'm going to let the world know how great I am and 
how I'm on the right path and how everyone else should be on the right path. And I'm going to talk about it constantly. Arrogance. Arrogance is the greatest hindrance to becoming an invisible hero because you want everything to be visible. So you don't heed the mandate of Romans 12, 2 through 3. Turn in your Bibles to Romans 12, 2. I'm going to give you the corrected translation. Romans 12, 2 through 3. Arrogance is the greatest hindrance to becoming an invisible hero. So we are commanded to heed this mandate written by Paul in Romans chapter 12, verses 2 through 3. And what it means when you fall under arrogance is that you've lost any impact whatsoever, any invisible impact, You've not become a blessing by association for anyone, but rather a thorn in the flesh of the believer who's actually moving forward in the spiritual life. You will try to hinder that believer. You will judge that believer from legalism. You will make up all sorts of man-made rules and say, he doesn't follow those rules. He doesn't follow the way I live. He'll never make it as a pastor. Why, look at his jokes. How vile. Why, that pastor said a cuss word. So did the Apostle Paul. And uh, the Apostle Paul is far more vulgar than I've ever been behind a pulpit in terms of what men and women think of vulgarity. One time I taught exactly what Paul had to say, and the women in the congregation blushed. And yet, I'm sure they've watched movies that were far more vulgar than anything that came out of my mouth. You see, the problem with society and especially with our pilgrim society, is the fact that we peg people. You don't peg people. We peg the politician, depending upon which party in which he's affiliated. The Republican is pegged in one way, and the Democrat is pegged in another way. And uh, we have a tendency to peg people, which uh, brings out all sorts of hypocrisies. For example, just for example, we have Anthony Weiner, who's become a joke in the country. I think mainly it's because of his name, too. But society pegged that man. We also have another man who made some mistakes in that same area. His name was Bill Clinton. Society pegged him in a different way. In fact, I remember all through that time, they kept saying his poll ratings were over 60%. 66% of the American people love this guy. After all, it's just about sex. It's just about sex. It's just about sex. That's all we heard. Well, there's more to do with it than that, but I'm not going to bring it up or go into it. I'm just giving you an example of how we peg people. Or Newt Gingrich has a divorce, and that has to become a big subject in a debate, a primary debate. And then he has to explain himself as to what happened. It's nobody's business what happened in the fact that he divorced his wife. You don't know anything. You don't have all the facts. You're not supposed to have all the facts. It's none of your business. 
But we peg people. And we peg them in different ways. And the worst thing ever is how society pegs a pastor. They put the pastor up there and say, perfection. The pastor is at the perfection level, and they peg him there. And if the pastor does something that uh, doesn't reflect what they consider perfection, then they try to destroy the peg. But they placed the peg up there. that we peg people in different ways. And so the fact that I was quoting the Apostle Paul, word for word, quoting him from the original languages, caused the congregation, especially the ladies, to blush. But if they had heard a joke on Comedy Central, they wouldn't blush, they would laugh. Why? Pegging of people. The comedian, well, he gets pegged way down here. He can say whatever he wants, any type of filth. The filthier, the better. Right? It's the way it seems in society. And all it does is bring out the hypocrisy of the old sin nature. Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make it clear right now that I'm just a man. And you are to listen to the word of God that I preach and know nothing about my life. Period. So Romans 12, 2 through 3. Stop being conformed to this world. What does that mean? Well, to a legalist, they make it mean whatever they want. They say, if you're conformed to this world, that means all the ladies in the country wear makeup. If you wear makeup, you're conforming to the world. Well, that's one set of man-made values, false values. Here's another set. The Amish say, if we use technology, we are conforming to the world, or as they call us, the English. And we can't conform to the world. So therefore we'll be different from the world and ride in horse and buggy. Use antiquated tools. No electricity. They still use technology. You ever heard of the wheel? It's technology. (laughs) So you see the hypocrisy of it all. And so that doesn't have anything. In fact, they are conforming to the world. What's the world trying to do? Well, as far as the world of unbelievers, if they have any concern about God whatsoever, they try to impress God by who and what they are, by being good, etc. And they go the broad way. But the world actually refers to cosmos diabolicus. That's Satan's system. It's not related to anyone's pet peeves. It's definitely not related to the pet peeves of the religious. The religious have come up with all types of pet peeves. And uh, they can form any type of pet peeve they wish. And it changes from generation to generation. There was a time when smoking cigarettes was, especially in the South, since it was grown there, nothing was ever said about smoking a cigarette. They would smoke a cigarette in the church parking lot, throw their butt right there down on the pavement, go to church. After the 20-minute service, they'd go back outside and light up another cigarette and stand around and talk and smoke their cigarettes. wasn't even an issue. Well... But then later on it became a pet peeve of society and of the religious type. But that's not being conformed to the world just because you enjoy certain things. Some people have thought that 
especially in the past, watching television is being conformed to the world. When the radio came out, listening to the radio was being conformed to the world. When Elvis danced a jig, well, that was straight from the devil himself, and that was being conformed to the world. That's not what it means at all. It is not a form of asceticism. Because anything the unbeliever can do is not the spiritual life. And the unbeliever can abstain from television. He can abstain from Elvis Presley, even if he runs into him at the Kroger's. <laughs> he can abstain from anything that the unbeliever, that the believer can abstain from. That's not to say that we shouldn't abstain from certain things. That's a matter of your own spiritual growth. It's a matter of your own areas of weakness, your own genetic makeup, because genetics have a lot to do with the way in which you will go as far as the old trends of the old sin nature, and so, so does environment. And you may switch from one to another. You may go from legalist to antinomian or antinomian to legalist. You may uh, switch back and forth, flop back and forth from both, and you're the most irritating person on the earth. <laughs> you know, because it's hard to take you. It's hard to under. Are you going to be a legalist today or are you going to be an antinomian today? I wish I knew which because I want to know what to say. <laughs> and then you have to walk on eggshells. Well, that's not conformity. That is conformity to this world. Conformity to this world is being involved in the cosmic system. It's lack of knowing the rebound technique and being filled with the spirit. One thing the unbeliever cannot do is have any relationship with God the Father, God the Son, or God the Holy Spirit. So stop being conformed to this world, the cosmic system, but be transformed. How? Everybody has their ideas about transformation. Some people will stand up and give testimonies about how they believed in Christ and they had a sudden transformation in their behavior. And they'll get up and give a testimony. Before I was saved, I saw prostitutes. Before I was saved, I was a drunkard. Before I was saved, I lied and deceived people. Before I was saved, I did this and that. Before I was saved, I smoked cigarettes. But now that I am saved, I don't drink beer, I don't touch alcohol. I haven't touched alcohol for 10 years since the day of my salvation. And I haven't been with a prostitute. And I have lived a most upstanding and moral life. All they've done is turned over a leaf, a new leaf. But there's still a leaf. They may not even be saved. Because salvation has to do with you believe in Jesus Christ and you're saved you then receive automatically 40 things. And you're just now saved and you didn't do a thing to, to receive those 40 things. Not a thing. It was grace. It's by grace you are saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. What is the transformation then? Well, in Romans, it's talking to the believer. And it's actually talking about a transformation that occurs over time. And how? But be transformed by the renovation of your thinking. In other words, post-salvation epistemological rehabilitation. Be transformed by the renovation of your thinking. The unique spiritual life 
is a system of thinking. The greatest happiness that can be derived from life is from thinking. Then he continues, so that you may prove what the will of God is, namely, the good of intrinsic value achievement. The good of intrinsic value achievement simply means your advance to spiritual maturity. It has to be translated good of intrinsic value because the word good in the English language has been distorted. And in fact, the English language doesn't really have a broad enough scope to explain good. It's kind of like the word hope. You could go up to an English speaker and say, well, let's say it was during the 2008 election and they wanted hope and change. You could go up to them and say, what is hope? And they wouldn't be able to answer you. What kind of change do you want? And they might give you a list. And then you could say, you think this man's going to give you those types of changes? Has he mentioned anything about those changes? What is hope? What are we changing to? What are we hoping for? And the reason those broad terms were used is because the English language is so lacking. People simply, it's actually a brilliant political move, which has been done on many occasions. You take words that are practically meaningless because people assign to it whatever they wish. They hear hope and they think about I hope for this, that, and the other. Yeah, we need some hope in this country. But someone else has different hopes, and they say, I hope for this, that, and the other, and it's totally antithetical to what you hope for. So you assign to a man all these things that you think hope is. And change. All the things that you want changed, you assign to the man. You say, that man will make these changes because it's very subjective and people tend to be subjective, especially when it comes to words that really have no meaning in the English language. One of those words is good. What's good? By whose standards is something good? You could go on a moral crusade and say, I'm being good, I'm doing good things, when all you're doing is whitewashing the devil's world you're doing the devil's bidding. You could do like the movement in the 1920s. There was a great movement against alcohol and they wanted to make it illegal. Especially the women. They were tired of their men coming home drunk. Which is understandable. But they went into a crusade about it. And they thought they were doing good. You know what happened from all those good intentions? Those good intentions led to the greatest rise in the mafia ever. A lot of good they did. Led to all sorts of activities. Turned law-abiding citizens into criminals. And that's where moonshine came from. And they'd have to go out in the woods and do their little moonshine stuff. Make their own alcohol. Didn't stop the problem. Your good intentions intensified a problem. Intensified other problems. Here's something that has good intention or sounds like good intention. There's too much poverty in this country. Let's rid this country of poverty. And we will do so through the redistribution of wealth. Good intentions. But all it does is increase poverty. In New Jersey, where they practice this, 
redistribution of wealth and in this country where we're practicing it, practicing it, and as a result we have recession. But in New Jersey, 52% of the people are said to live below the poverty level or below that poverty line. I've been to New, to New Jersey. What a weird place. And there are so many rules, it's unbelievable. If you leave your home, you better have some cash with you. Probably about 40 bucks will do just fine. So you never know what toll you're going to run into. Toll here, toll there, toll everywhere. And if you want to make a left turn, forget about it. Well, it was the most confusing place I had ever been to. And why? People with good intentions mess that place up terribly. Here's something that might be of good intention. A mayor of New York will say, why everybody's getting fat, therefore I ban 32 ounce soft drinks. And he does so from good intention, I guess. Probably just power lust, but anyway, some people, at least, not in the majority, but some people say, yeah, that's a good thing. Yeah, we need to help some people lose some weight, sure. Let's go to the 16-ounce uh, and not the 32-ounce. But you can see the flaw in all of that. So when you come to this verse and you say, and you see the word good, well, it's whatever you make of it, right? Right. Therefore, you have to go into the Greek... And it has to be good of intrinsic value. And the only good that has intrinsic value is the divine good that is produced under the filling of God the Holy Spirit. Anything produced outside of fellowship is wood, hay, and stubble. So the good of intrinsic value achievement simply means you're advanced to spiritual maturity. The well-pleasing to God. This means the execution of the protocol plan. The mature status quo. That means the manufacture of the invisible hero. For I say through the grace which has been given to me to everyone who is among you, stop thinking of self in terms of arrogance beyond what you ought to think, but think in terms of sanity for the purpose of being rational without illusion, as God has assigned to each one of us a standard of thinking from doctrine. That's why you need a pastor teacher to explain these verses to you. Otherwise, you become subjective and you assign to good whatever good you think is good and you're arrogant and don't know it. And that arrogance will be the stumbling block that will keep you from ever getting to spiritual maturity. And you will wander around in spiritual childhood. I don't care if you listen to doctrine every single night at a certain time and you apparently listen for an hour, but your mind wanders quite a bit. You're not filled with the Spirit. And after all, you're good enough in your own estimation. And if there's anything I wish I could beat into the heads of some people is this. If the unbeliever can do it, it's not the spiritual way of life. Now, the invisible hero, what we'll study now for a, for a brief moment, is a personal sense of destiny. The invisible hero develops a personal sense of destiny. The Apostle Paul got there very quickly because when the Apostle Paul latched on to something, he was single-minded in purpose. 
As a religious man, he was so single-minded in his religion, which is the devil's ace trump, that he became the chief of all sinners. So when the apostle Paul did something, he was going to become the chief of it. When he went into religion, he was going to become the chief of all religion. He succeeded and thus become the chief of all sinners of all human history. And then when he was saved, he had a single-minded purpose to learn the word of God, to run the race, to get the crown, and to spread the gospel throughout the known world, and he did it. When it comes to the unique spiritual life, you have to have a single-mindedness. That means a purpose. And when you have a purpose, you have a personal sense of destiny. So what is a personal sense of destiny? It is that standard of thinking from doctrine that gives the invisible impact of the invisible hero. It provides the magnetism of his spiritual function, his utilization of the problem-solving devices, and his invisible impact in six categories occurs. What is magnetism? I don't know if you know this, but the fastest train in the world is in Japan, and it doesn't even run off of electricity. It runs off of magnetism. Positive and negative magnets are its rail, and the magnets force it down the track. Magnets, that's all, just magnets. And that thing goes so fast, it starts to float like a jet without wings all due to magnetism, and that's invisible. That's an invisible power. An invisible power, and it's very, very quiet as it goes down the tracks. Anyway, it's a standard of thinking from doctrine that gives the invisible impact of the invisible hero and provides the magnetism of his spiritual function, which is unseen. Accompanying his invisible magnetism is a personal sense of destiny. And a personal sense of destiny provides a pure motivation that takes the believer all the way to the ultimate objective of the spiritual life, which is occupation with the person of Jesus Christ. So, God has a plan, a purpose, and a format for our lives. Are you wandering around aimlessly? Well, I want you to know something. God has a plan for your life. Are you depressed because everything that you imagined you would receive in life you have not received? Are you depressed because you're coming out of college and there are no jobs for you in your field of study? And so now you're working part-time at a McDonald's or at some retail store or in some part of the service industry making very little money, still living with your parents, You can't go anywhere with your degree because they all want someone with experience. So you look at your life and say, everything that I proposed as a purpose for me is not coming to fruition. Why not? You might ask. I'm here, I'm here to tell you there's a higher purpose for you than those things that you desire and want and lust for. And that purpose is related to the execution of God's plan for your life. Why has God not given you all the desires of your heart? 
Seek ye first the kingdom of heaven, and all these things will be added unto you. Are you seeking first the kingdom of heaven? No. You're seeking first all of the pleasures of life and all of the false standards of values that you have. Instead of wanting to receive the claps and praise of angels, you're looking for the praise and adoration of man. Your values are upside down. And no wonder in such a culture in which we live. So you're depressed. I understand it. The country is depressed. And for a reason. To wake you up. To those values that are eternal in nature. So that you might have a true sense of destiny. True happiness. Oh, there's testing along the way. There's extraordinary testing along the way. But that going through that testing and passing that testing is far better than going through the unbearable punishment that will be brought upon you. Most people read the verse, God will not give me more than I can handle, and they apply it to their lives. But if you're out of fellowship, he gives you far more than you can handle. He skins you alive with a whip, every son whom he receives. So when under punishment, you receive far more than you can handle. When under testing, while painful, you can handle it with the spiritual life. And God will give you a way of escape, as it were, through the ten problem-solving devices. I saw on Facebook, it said this, where somebody posted it, and it's quite funny. It said, uh, it's been said that God will never give you more than you can handle. And then it said, God must think I'm a badass. Well, that's not really the principle because of the fact that if you're out of fellowship, you will get more punishment than you can handle to wake you up. And of course, it almost border, it does border, it is blasphemous because God doesn't think anyone's a badass not in the terms that, that what we mean by that. How dare a pastor say that? You've just pegged me, see? You pegged me in a place to where I can't use colloquial language. Why not? Because you're a legalist? You think I'm going to change my language for you? Then you'll bring out a verse. Well, it says in the Bible that you should not use any type of I don't know what the way they put it from their King James Version, that you should, all coarse language should be removed from you. What is coarse language? Gossip, maligning, and judging about a person who simply talked about a donkey. <laughs> a jackass. That's what it means, coarse language. My goodness. If you could read what the Apostle Paul would write in the Greek. Here's a Greek word for you if you're listening, legalist. Look it up. Skubala. It's Koine Greek. Meaning common language. Common Greek. The words on the street. You ever been down the street and listened to people talk? Common language. And why common language? Because the word of God is for everyone. It's obviously not for the legalist who's so arrogant they stick their nose up in the air. They're so great, they don't need instruction. In fact, they will instruct the pastor. Bring it. And I'll have some choice words for you that'll make you blush. 
And the Apostle Paul had some choice words. Scubala, look it up. Oh, you don't have a Greek lexicon. Look it up on the internet. There's Greek lexicons on the internet. Here's something that the Apostle Paul told everyone uh, in Galatians. You see, the Galatians thought that, well, they came to believe from, that uh, the only way a person could be saved if, is if they were circumcised because the Judaizers came in and said, yeah, Paul said believe in Christ and you'll be saved, and that's good, but there's more to it. You also have to be circumcised. And the Galatians really liked that idea because it was part of their heritage. Before they became believers, they were under a system of religion in which a certain practice occurred to where the priests under this religion would cut off their phallus. If you don't know what a phallus is, I'm sorry for you. <laughs> And they would cut it completely off. So they said, yeah, I understand this part. That used to be part of my culture. And they're asking me to be circumcised. Well, that's not as drastic. Sounds good to me. And they believed this. Now, one thing I don't understand is why the ladies didn't say, well, what must we do for salvation? Because obviously they weren't going to be circumcised. But that never even became an issue. So here are these arrogant men walking around, I must be circumcised to be saved, and then when they were circumcised, they bragged about it. I've been circumcised, have you been circumcised? And the whole issue turned from what Christ did on to the cross to the foreskin of a penis. The whole issue went from Christ to the foreskin of a penis. Isn't that something? That's what religion will do. Talk about confusion. Well, guess what Paul did? Paul came riding in, or writing in, to save the day. And this is what he said to them in his sarcasm. If you can be saved by circumcision, well, why not be really saved and cut your whole penis off? And then you'll be really saved. Well, they caught, they caught the uh, sarcasm. And they realized how stupid they had been because the issue went away from the cross to their penis. How weird. But that's religion for you. Some of the most perverted people in the planet or on the planet are religious people. I know because I've been around them. All they think about is sex and how people are having sex and doing and they're not and everyone else is and everyone else is bad because they're having sex and they don't have sex so they're wonderful they don't even have sex in marriage sometimes and if they did they obviously don't know how or what they're doing bunch of weirdos anyway Christianity's full of nutcases, but the spiritual life is not for fruity people or nutcases. It's for sanity, as Romans 12, 2 through 3 puts it. And it is a standard of thinking. Thinking, thinking, thinking. So this results in the invisible hero. And then in Romans 9.23, if you want to flip back to that, you're close to it. Romans 9.23, it says, In order that he might make known to you the riches of his glory on vessels of mercy which he prepared in advance for his glory. Vessels of mercy are those who are humble enough to respond to the grace of God. The invisible hero with a personal sense of destiny is a vessel of mercy. 
Are you a vessel of mercy? Are you single-minded in the acquisition of the Word of God? Do you have a personal sense of destiny? All this you can ask of yourself. And as you ponder these things, we will close. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed, Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege and opportunity of studying these things. May God the Holy Spirit challenge us. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen.